never know how really good he could have become. Uh, Pro become. The last punch he threw was probably just before he got shot. <laughs> That's right. Okay. And because uh, you opened the book with that. Mm. He broke somebody's jaw. Yeah. One of the shooters. That's right. And then you never tell us which one it was. It was the, the, the shooter who was the taller guy, which was the guy uh, uh, Fallon, Ricky Fallon, that was suspected of being Ricky Fallon. Uh -huh. uh, the other guy, the... Um, okay, but there was no suspicion he got his jaw broken, right? That guy went around with a broken jaw, right? Well, you know, there was a bit of a gap before the trial, so uh -huh. uh, it, got, it, got, it got all fixed up mm -hmm. eventually. Um, Okay, why why'd you leave that out of the book? What, which which one it was? You just mentioned that. No, I, I think uh, it, I am... Um, because I read the whole rest of the book. I'm like, okay, yeah. who got this job broken? Oh, no, if you, if, you, if you read it again, you'll know that the, the guy who pulled the gun out in the first instant while he was at the back of the alley and, and DePaula put his hand up like he would in a ring mm. to dodge a .22 Magnum bullet. Um, when he, when, uh, that was the taller guy, uh, which would be the, the person who was suspected of being Ricky Fallon, if I okay. could put it that way. All right. And then the guy who was first in line chasing DePaula out, who, uh, where DePaula stumbles, and in that split second he fires a shot, so it was actually two shooters, and this guy's the guy who shoots him in the back. That was the heavy set guy, the shorter guy, the guy who they police thought was Gary Garofolo, who as we know was acquitted, um, although it could have been a similar guy okay. named uh, Reynolds. All right, something uh, else struck me about that. Like you talk about, well, I think maybe you paint a, a nicer picture of Frankie DePaula than the person that he might have been. There's, there's people that I've talked to that said this this wasn't just a guy that stood up to trouble. He went looking for trouble. He mm -hmm. was uh, what they used to call a hard guy. He wanted yeah. to be a hard guy. Yeah. And he would hang out on Duncan Avenue looking to start trouble with people. Okay? Mm -hmm. That's, you know, one of the things that I... He was not a nice guy. Okay? Yeah. However, like he was a draw yeah. at the fights and he became a hero to where he got a police escort, I think by helicopter too, yeah. right? Yeah. Lincoln Park. And then he's in the charity ward of uh, the Jersey City Medical Center, you know? Yeah. Where as high as they made him, mm. they certainly left him very quickly, right? Yeah. They being, you know, the, uh, the people in power, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the first bit of your scenario there, you can't, um, you know, I was told right at the beginning, you talk about Frankie de Paul, that they're going to be this people who will say this about him, and they're going to be these people who are going to say that about him. And at the end of the day, you know you're not going to satisfy either of them, mm -hmm. because I've gotten heat from certain people who feel I've painted a bad picture of him, that he, I painted him as a bully. Mm -hmm. And there are others, who, just like yourself, who said I didn't actually go far enough. Oh, I'm but not I, saying that. I'm saying there yeah, is another side to it. That's right. Okay. But I think a lot of that is actually represented there anyway. Because, for instance, you, you'll note that there was a time, an anecdote of he him. He punched a guy who was passed out on yeah, a... Yeah, he came, put his chin there, yeah. drunk. Yeah. That just for the sake of it, yeah. punches him. I mean, he did things without a conscience. Yeah. And there are certain people who knew him, or they might have been relatives of him, uh, they, they feel hurt and aggrieved about it, but there's no reason to disbelieve that. I mean, mm -hmm. it, it, it is there. He, he, it's on the record, the trouble he got into, and a lot of it wasn't necessarily him just um, helping people, being mm -hmm. the Robin Hood character. I mean, you had a situation where we paint, not, well, not only that he was a mob collector who literally made a man um, lose control of his bowels. Mm -hmm. So that gives you an idea of the fear that uh, people had for him, certain people had for him. 
um, but also a brutal robbery. But an robbery. another picture that so. you paint that's quite interesting. He robbed something. It might have been the it might have been the ingots. Okay, it might have been the copper. Yeah. Okay, but they took the trailer to a place that was under surveillance. Yeah. Was that the copper? That was the copper. Okay. Robbery. And then they could not move the copper because the place was under surveillance, but the cops were on break at the time that they pulled the trailer in there. Yeah. However, they couldn't go back and get the stuff. Mm. However, it would have been very hard to prosecute these guys on it because by the time anything came up, all the copper was gone. <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. All the while that the cops were watching this yard, mm. that copper slowly disappeared. No, 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 that, not at all. I mean, what happened was that they did actually retrieve all of the copper and took it back to police, the police department in oh, Jersey okay. City. But and then, then it disappeared. The stock <laughs> gradually. <laughs> so it just shows you okay. the good guys and the guys protecting law and order. Right, right, <laughs> right. So what we're saying in the 70s, yeah. late 60s, 70s, the Jersey City cops... Okay, we're not to be trusted. Well, that, that or some part. of them. This is part of what we've mentioned in the book. We try and put the Paula's life in the context of the history of Jersey City and the prevailing circumstances in the '60s. You know, starting off with the uh, the kind of uh, the reality created by uh, Frank Haig, the long-term mayor of Jersey City. Uh, which, uh, although this was like uh, on the face of a devout Roman Catholic working class community who did adhere to the tenets of faith and uh, you know loved their neighbors in a sense and looked out for each other, but the dichotomy was that actually they were in this situation where they, they saw illegal numbers being done all the time. People of Frank and Paul. Okay, now numbers is not a bad thing. Okay. <laughs> said because <laughs> I well, know a few people. This was, this Numbers is not a bad thing, yeah. or was not a bad thing before well, and, the state and, took and it over. Although the government yeah. would prosecute you for that, but sure. this was just natural <laughs> yeah. for everybody. But it was run by the mob, yeah. and so as a survival mechanism, people grew up. People of this generation, they they actually grew up thinking the mob guys were the good guys, mm -hmm. and the cops and the FBI were the bad guys. You know, I did put it. Specifically well, they might have helped prove it too. Another aspect of this, yeah, there was no convictions in the Frankie De Paula murder. Absolutely. Okay? Now, yeah. in your book, you seem to kind of attribute it to errors or lack of foresight. There were errors in uh, the prosecution. I mean, one of the things it was um, uh, Frankie De Paula's. Uh, he he he. He mentioned Gary Garofola and Ricky Fallon as the people who shot him. Um, that could have been put in evidence in court if it had been made as a dying declaration and the defense would have had access to, uh, to him as well. Sure. But for, a technicality, for technical reasons, that didn't come to pass. Well, your supposition so, was they didn't think he was going to die. They, that's right. Yeah. And I can't help thinking... Maybe maybe they took a dive. The prosecutors. 